All right, looks like uh, most people are, are with us. And so we're gonna go ahead and, and get started. Uh, good morning, my name is Scott Tomorrow. I'm a high school social studies teacher, uh, proud to serve as president of the Ohio Education Association. OEA represents 120,000 public school educators uh, from pre-K through higher education in all 88 counties of Ohio. Uh, and OEA is a strong supporter of House Bill 497 uh, and a resolution that is pending before the State Board of Education to support House Bill 497, which would eliminate uh, the requirement currently under state law uh, that students who do not pass uh, the third grade reading test uh, are required to be uh, retained uh, in third grade. Um, as you're going to hear from today's guests, mandated retention under the so-called third grade reading guarantee is a policy that has failed students, families, and educators. The decision, very important decision, about how best to serve the needs of each student uh, is a decision that ought to be held uh, as one that is conducted in collaboration between educators and parents, uh, all looking at all the information that's available and thinking about the best interest of each individual student. One size fits all policy, like the mandatory third grade reading guarantee retention requirement, uh, does not serve our students, has not been effective uh, as a matter of public policy and is something that needs to change. So I'm very pleased that we have uh, a very distinguished panel of speakers uh, to share their perspectives uh, and insights on this important issue. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Dr. Paul Thomas. Uh, Dr. Thomas is a professor of education, also a former public school educator uh, who has done some extensive research, uh, including uh, having written um, a piece on a critical examination of, of grade retention as reading policy white paper. Um, and so we're gonna share his research as it relates to law in Ohio. We'll hear from Dr. Christina Collins, a uh, member of the State Board of Education from Medina County, uh, who is a sponsor of a resolution currently under consideration uh, to uh, urge the General Assembly to repeal House Bill, or to pass House Bill 497 and, and repeal mandatory retention. Uh, we have one of the primary co-sponsors, uh, mm -hmm. Representative Gail Manning. Uh, she is the chair of the Ohio House Education Committee. Uh, she is a uh, career educator herself uh, who has shown tremendous leadership uh, in uh, the General Assembly on this and other issues affecting our students. Uh, and then we have Karen Carney, a fourth grade teacher in the Camel Local Schools in the Mahoning Valley, uh, to share her perspective uh, on this issue. And then we'll have an opportunity for all of you to ask questions. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Paul Thomas uh, from Furman University uh, to talk about his research on the impact of mandatory retention policy. Dr. Thomas. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, as noted, uh, I've been a literacy educator now for almost 40 years, about half of that as a public school teacher. And since the early 2000s, I have been focusing on uh, the use of grade retention as part of reading policy, which uh, initially began really as a policy in Florida. And uh, then since about 2013, late 2010, uh, many more states have been uh, adopting mandatory grade retention using high stakes testing in sort of what has been called the science of reading movement. Uh, sadly, the evidence over decades is that grade retention is harmful to students. It's strongly correlated with students dropping out of high school. Uh, but in in uh, today's world, the uh, allure of raising test scores has made grade retention kind of a popular political thing. Yes, in some cases, grade retention has resulted in uh, early test scores uh, being raised, but over time that disappears. And what we'd like to focus on today is the, are the negative consequences. In Ohio, for example, grade retention disproportionately impacts Black students about 
40% of grade retention of fourth graders are black students and about 30%, uh, excuse me, about 50% are third graders. And Mississippi uh, is a state that is used as a model for this. About 70% of the students who are retained are black. And our concern is the research on grade retention to raise reading test scores has shown that there is no evidence that the grade retention is helping students. What may be happening are the other elements of the reading policy are helping these students. So because of the negative consequences of grade retention, which several of our panelists here today will emphasize, uh, we're urging that states no longer mandate or ban grade retention. Uh, grade retention should be a decision made among educators and parents, uh, not by a uh, caveat and not as a, as mentioned before, as a one size fits all policy. Um, my final point is grade retention is actually a punitive approach. It is not an approach to reading. And I would strongly advocate for focusing reading policy on actual reading and not punishing our students. Uh, I will turn this over now. I think Dr. Collins will go next. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Thomas. And, and as uh, we welcome Dr. Christina Collins, I just wanna add that uh, in addition to serving as a member of the State Board of Education, uh, Dr. Collins herself is, is a professional educator uh, and has some extensive experience, uh, both at the classroom and district level, looking at uh, assessment and curriculum issues. Uh, and so I think that perspective and that expertise is really helpful as we have this discussion. So uh, Dr. Collins, please take it from here. Thank you, thank you so much. Good morning, thank you all for having me and thank you for bringing attention to this very important issue. Um, the resolution that the State Board of Education is looking at has not been voted on by the State Board yet, but I wanted to share some um, additional and some personal thoughts on the resolution as well. So as we all know, data is a fundamental aspect of academic achievement in Ohio education. We use it for measuring every measurable aspect of schools like funding, attendance, student to teacher ratios and standardized test scores among many other uses. Um, as someone who has been a curriculum director for close to a decade, data was, data was my life for those 10 years. Um, policymakers have become almost solely reliant on data to tell narratives about the successes or lack thereof in districts, schools, and students and student achievement. It should stand to reason then that the same data should be reliable in determining the success or lack thereof in government initiated educational mandates. In May, the Performance and Impact Committee of the State Board of Education began a conversation around increasing the third grade promotion score, which would in turn cause more students to fall below the promotion score and be retained. As part of this conversation, we, the committee, requested data from the Ohio Department of Education around retained students and their performance once retained, as well as in subsequent years. The results, to be honest, were abysmal. Dr. Thomas talked about data, and I wanna revisit that conversation with some more specifics from Ohio, again, from the Ohio Department of Education. On average, since the 2013-2014 school year, Ohio has retained around 3,628 students per year. Notably, on average, as he mentioned, uh, disproportionate effects on uh, subgroup populations. Notably, on average, 48% of those students were black, 31% were white, and 92% of the students who were retained were economically disadvantaged. Again, those are averages over the course of uh, the retention policy being in place. On their second time taking the test, on average, only 14% were proficient. So they've taken it once, they weren't proficient the first time, they've sat through an entire year of third grade again, and still only 14% were proficient after that second year while watching their classmates move on through school. That's still an average of 3,121 students who did not score proficient despite the entire year behind their peers. In subsequent years, so after, after retaking third grade, students fare even worse. Only 8% of those retained were proficient in fourth grade. 10% in fifth grade, 
4% in sixth grade, 7% in seventh grade, and only 3% in eighth grade. The data tells a simple story, consequencing students who struggle to read by retaining them in third grade has not worked. In the business world, such a minimal return on an investment would be called a failure. The resolution in front of the State Board of Education recognizes the importance of literacy and of measurement towards a state goal of improving literacy. And it requests that the General Assembly repeal the retention provision of Ohio Revised Code 3313.608. If we're going to rely on data to determine successes and failures, we should do so for all programs and initiatives. The data in this case tell us retaining third graders in Ohio has failed as an initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collins. And um, again, when, whenever we're talking about state education policy, uh, I think we need to be looking at the lens, number one, of what's best for students and what's working and what's not working. So I'm very uh, happy that uh, Representative Gail Manning uh, has teamed up with uh, State Representative Phil Robinson on a bipartisan basis, uh, using the expertise and leadership that she developed as a classroom teacher uh, for 37 years uh, to lead the fight in the, in the House uh, to pass House Bill 497. Uh, Representative Manning, please uh, tell us a little bit more about the legislation and where we are right now. Thank you very much, Scott, for, for uh, that. Um, I did teach for 37 years, and while I was teaching, uh, most of that was in second through fifth grade, um, but most of it was in third grade. And so one of the things that has bothered me, um, I voted for, for the bill back uh, over 10 years ago, that would retain children um, uh, because they did allow me to put in an amendment that said that um, students that were retained, if, it, if the teacher and the principal thought that the student should have passed, they, they could take another test. But it has really bothered me. I've received many phone calls from parents that, you know, parents that had students that were doing very well, but they heard that uh, they would be retained if they didn't pass it, they're having nightmares. Um, and, you know, to put that kind of pressure on a third grade just didn't make sense to me. So uh, Representative Robinson and I knew that um, the scores hadn't moved in the past 10 years and we decided to do a fairly simple bill. This gives parents a, a voice and if their child should be retained because um, we know they know their uh, students better than anyone else. And if their children are, um, have difficulty taking tests and a lot of anxiety, uh, that probably isn't what we should be doing. I, we are certainly not against retention. Um, retention might be better off in kindergarten or first grade when you, you realize that uh, a child is struggling. Maybe they started school a little bit earlier because of the, the dates that we have in there. Um, and then the only other thing that this um, does is to make sure that they would have to continue with the intense intervention that they get. But we also get rid of the fall uh, state diagnostic test because we have found that most schools and probably all of them uh, give other tests where they can get almost immediate results, uh, shorter tests. And so that, that the teachers then can uh, change the way that they're teaching to that child, or they can adjust where that child is, you know, who's getting an intervention, who isn't, and they can make those changes immediately as compared to the diagnostic taste, taste state test that they don't get for a couple of months, the results of that. So it didn't make sense to us. One of the things I've had conversations with state school board, uh, President uh, McGuire and uh, Vice President Manchester and ODE. And I know that their top priorities right now, which it should be for all of us. And that's what I wanna see also in the legislation um, is literacy, making that a priority, finding out better ways of making sure that our students have a, a better chance of succeeding when it comes to literacy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Representative Manning. And um, again, to emphasize what was just shared, you know, as we think about why it was so important for us as an organization to support House Bill 497, 
Uh, it's not because we don't believe that there should be appropriate intervention for students to provide extra support uh, when that's necessary. But again, a burdensome, one-size-fits-all approach that is punitive in nature and demonstrated to be ineffective uh, shouldn't be the basis for education policy in Ohio. Uh, again, uh, Representative Manning uh, has helped lead a bipartisan effort to get House Bill 497 passed by an overwhelming margin in the State House of Representatives. Now we need uh, the support of the Senate uh, in order for this bill to pass. I, I wanna acknowledge that State Senator Teresa Fetter, who is the ranking member of the Senate Education Committee uh, is with us today. And Senator Fetter, we really appreciate your support uh, as we uh, continue this conversation, both with the State Board and then, uh, and then with the Ohio Senate. The last person I wanna to introduce today is uh, a personal friend of mine, uh, someone who has extensive experience uh, teaching uh, in elementary school, in the Camel Local Schools up in, in uh, the Mahoning Valley in Northeast Ohio, outside of Youngstown. Uh, Karen Carney taught for many years in third grade, recently moved to fourth grade, has a perspective uh, of what the implications of this legislation are. Uh, and uh, Karen has also served as a member of the Ohio Educator Standards Board. So uh, Karen, welcome. Uh, please share a little bit of your perspective. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you for uh, having me a part of this press conference. I feel nervous, not because of speaking, but it's because I'm representing my fellow educators and also my students. So this morning they're like, go ahead, Mrs. Carney, go get them because they know that we all fight for what's best for them. So uh, interesting that all the data is taken care of, so I don't have to address that as much, but I've taught first, second, third, and now I'm in fourth grade, and I was also a literacy coach. And so the whole basis of who I am stems from the, the literacy aspect and the learning. And we've spoken about data and what data does and what data is supposed to do. So behind me, it's so funny because when I came for the... Um, the pre the like testing out the situation I happen to be in the only room in the school right now that nobody is occupying and all around the room is a data wall every student who enters Camel Elementary from kindergarten and wherever from any other time in between we keep we keep records of them and we use that data not to punish or um belittle we use that data to drive our instructional practices where uh, we are comparing the student to themselves from the very first day to the day they leave us to go to our middle school and then our high school. So the data should, should be used for the student. So instead of a standardized, well, you compare this much, you know, you're, this is where you stand with someone else. We are just using that data that is collected to help us inform our instruction and to move our students along the way. So the school I teach in is a small urban setting and we have every subgroup and that is never something that has stopped the incredible staff that I work with and admin, admin that we work with. We know our kids come in with delays and experiences that are not up to um, the peers around in, in, in actually surrounding communities, but that does not stop us. So our contention is that every student can learn and every student can learn at their own pace. Unfortunately, that third grade reading guarantee and the retention piece that goes with it is something that has just caused nightmares all around. My first year in third grade, I, I heard overheard two little girls talking about, oh my God, you know that if we don't pass this test, they don't let us go to fourth grade. No eight, nine year old should have to deal with anything to, as stressful as something like that. School should be a place where you feel safe, where you feel people are, are your cheerleaders. And that is exactly what we do here so that was, that was an instance where it just completely broke my heart because having had taught first and second, I understand the huge transition of student thinking and the learning and the skill set required in third grade. So here they come in third grade and it's a whole different ball game. Now you're reading to learn, not learning to read. And immediately in October, they get zapped with that test that they probably can't read or understand anyway because it's what measures something at the end of third grade. Um, with all of that aside, though, too, um, we've had students who, despite our best efforts, have not passed the test. Uh, we've had extra instructional uh, classes for them, and they've had multiple opportunities. 
So there are all kinds of um, ways a, a, a district can approach that the child who has not passed and needs to be retained. And so one, one year we decided to do the three and a halfers. So those third graders who did not pass in third grade didn't really get promoted to fourth. They had to do their morning in third grade for the literacy instruction. And then they went in the afternoons for math, social studies and science. First of all, how devastating to a child's um, ego and self-esteem to know, first of all, that you failed. And then it's almost like wearing this proverbial scarlet letter. Oh, they have to go with the third graders in the morning and then they come to us in the, in the afternoon. Definitely was not, was not the, the um, answer to that question. And so speaking from my heart, for my colleagues and all of our students, and I would think colleagues, uh, teachers and students all across to define a student by one test score on one day in time is not the way to go. And there are so many circumstances um, that would play into that. And um, I don't know, I just, I just have a hard time with, with, with something like that. Uh, we are here to help them grow and nurture them along the way. And I've always been the biggest comp component of when you nurture them and love them, all of those good things are going to happen when they have this cloud of retention hanging over them, it is, it is just the most awful thing to, um, you know, to, to witness as, as an educator who loves her students with all of her heart and wants what's best for them. So I'm, we're hoping that the retention piece, piece is taken off and understanding that there are circumstances where students need to be retained, but one test score should not be the thing that defines that moment. And so, um, you know, being the, the teacher that I am, I will have to um, leave you with a quote, a couple of quotes actually. And so one was, uh, I just ran across it the other day, Diane Ravitch, sometimes the most brilliant and intelligent minds do not shine standardized tests because they do not have standardized minds. And it brings me back to one of my favorite stories, Mrs. Spitzer's garden. Here's this analogy of a teacher planting her garden every year knowing that there will be weeds, there will be pests, some will grow stronger, but it's taking that garden and growing that garden like we should be growing our students. And I thank you for letting me advocate for my fellow uh, school support staff and teachers and also our students. Thank, thank you. you, Karen, so much. And uh, Karen epitomizes what, uh, what kind of membership we have across the state, people who have entered this profession because they care deeply about the success of every single one of their students uh, because they want to make a difference for those students and they want to make sure that that they're supported in that effort uh, and not hindered by uh, ineffective public policy. So with that, let me uh, open it up and I'll ask uh, anyone who has a question, please use the raise hand function. Uh, in Zoom uh, to ask your questions and we'll go ahead and, and um, acknowledge uh, anybody with questions in the order that we see people uh, raising those hands. Uh, I have with me on OEA staff, Katie Olmstead, who's gonna kind of help, help with this, but uh, I see a couple of people, so we'll go ahead and start. I, I'm not sure who Kay Cano is, but uh, you have the first question. If you can Hi. Answer. Um Thank you. Uh, this is Krista Kano with Gongwer, and my question is uh, for Christina Collins. When do you anticipate that resolution will come up for a vote, and what kind of support um, from the board have you have you heard for the resolution? Thank you. Uh, this is this resolution was written. It was co-sponsored, so there's a co-sponsor on it um, that I would consider to be a very bipartisan resolution. Um, we have generated support from the board. It is assigned to be in legislative committee and will be discussed on Tuesday at, or tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow at the board meeting during legislative committee. And then it should be passed out of committee and it kind of depends. I mean, committee can pass it out with a request for emergency consideration, which would then cause it to be voted on on Wednesday. Um, or they could pass it without emergency consideration, which would push it to next month. But I do anticipate the legislative committee will take action on it tomorrow. Thank you. Next up, we have Anna Staver from the Columbus Dispatch. 
Uh, hi, this question is uh, probably more for uh, Representative Manning or the, the, the teacher, but really anyone. Um, you know, one of the, when you look at the, the statistics on reading uh, over the last decade or two, oh, Ohio's numbers really haven't changed much, which um, obviously makes, partially makes your argument, but is it time to sort of rethink how we teach reading? I know there's a lot of, uh, been a lot of controversy, particularly when it comes to how we teach dyslex dyslexic students to read, but um, should we be, broadly speaking, rethinking how we teach children to read? I'm happy to, to talk about that. When I, when I met with ODE and uh, the state school board, um, they wanted to make literacy uh, their priority. And speaking with Superintendent Siddons, um, she felt very strongly about this. I know that their budget has um, mainly focuses on literacy and uh, finding better ways of doing it. But I think another conversation we need to have is with the higher ed because I was just at a school the other day meeting with, um, in my district, meeting with people about literacy. And they said that even their first year teachers um, struggled with understanding of individualizing for those students in their class. And they almost felt like they had to reteach them when it came to teaching reading. So I think we need to have those conversations um, with the higher ed um, schools and also um, make sure that we just make it a priority now and find the best programs that we can offer. As you know, we, uh, the curriculum is chosen by the, the school system. So um, hopefully they, they find the ones that work best for them and, and uh, look to ODE for guidance. Thanks, Karen. Did you wanna uh, add anything to this? And, and let me, just, just as a way to segue to your comments, um, this is an issue for us as an organization that, that we're really bringing groups of members together uh, to talk about what are some of the, you know, proven strategies for reading instruction, because as decisions get made, uh, particularly at the local level, as Representative Manning was saying, it is critical that you have educators that are at, who are at the table, who have the expertise, uh, who have been able to, to see what works and, and what doesn't work. So, so uh, the worst thing that can happen is that these kinds of decisions get imposed on local educators from the state level. But Karen, can you uh, comment further on that? Yeah, I did have some thoughts on that. So I also taught pre-service um, students and, and it was the reading courses that I taught at Youngstown State University. And I feel that, not that we should tell everybody how to teach and what to teach, but there seems to needs to be some consistent piece right within the state of Ohio. And now because of all of these um, bills and issues that are front and center, all of these companies are, oh, science of reading is the best. Try this, do this, do that. Believe me, if there was a magic wand, we would have waved that long before. Um, I feel that taking bits of pieces of what you need. You definitely need a, a strong phonics background. That's the beginning piece, but that is not the end all be all. So finding uh, that, that perfect balance and for each student, it's going to be different as well, right within your classrooms, simply because we have different kinds of learners who learn different ways. And so, um, you know, exploring really good programs that are out there, but I still feel that it needs to be some of the basics along with some of the other things. and the demographic of where you are and the, the actual students in your classroom um, will play into that. But I feel, I, I do believe uh, and agree that the, the um, higher levels of, of learning, the, the colleges and universities need to um, be on the same page, so to speak. And so what page that is, we're hopefully trying to get to that. Um, that's all I have. Thank, Thank you. you friend. Uh, next person I see is M. Campbell. Thank you, Mike Campbell from WHIO TV in Dayton. Uh, this is for Scott or anyone that wants to take it on, but are we, basically we wanna, we wanna take this requirement away. Um, and I listened to everyone. So are we saying it's racist, classist, ineffective? What are we really saying about this requirement or all three? <laughs> I mean, why are we, why, do we, why does it need to go away? Well, I, I think uh, I, I will. I will speak to part of that, and I'll I'll ask Dr. Thomas to to weigh in again about some of the implications of the research that he had in terms of the the disproportionate impact on on students from different racial backgrounds. Uh, Dr. Collins may may want to add that 
uh, as well. But I th bottom line, uh, it's a policy that doesn't work. Uh, so we shouldn't be continuing with policies that, that, that aren't effective. Uh, and secondly, it's a policy that has, <clears throat> rather than encouraging collaboration you know, between uh, educators and families, uh, this is one of those things that, that drives a wedge. It's an, it's an outside hammer uh, that gets in the way of true collaboration between parents and educators uh, that, that teacher, the principal, the reading specialist, the people uh, who know, bet, know their, those children best, along with the parent of the child, to say, uh, for this particular child's interest, what do we think collectively is the best way to go, you know, to, to make a decision? Um, this policy fundamentally is disrespectful of the expertise of educators. And so that's why it's a big reason why we have a big concern, but let me ask Dr. Thomas if he wanted to add more about uh, the racial implications of, of this these kinds of policies across the country. Uh, yes, uh, I would say, you know, very quick bullet points would be number one, grade retention is not reading policy, it is punishment. And we're talking about reading policy. Uh, I would also focus on that re, uh, grade retention is harmful to all students. So um, as a, you know, as a general statement. But third, this is very important. Um, the students who are struggling most in public education in the United States are vulnerable populations. There are students who are struggling with racism, with poverty, with uh, a number of things beyond their control. And grade retention piles on negative consequences to those students without adding any value to their reading experience. Uh, and I think a key point is uh, grade retention actually gets in the way of our teachers doing the right thing. And uh, I, I cannot emphasize enough, the key problem is one size fits all mandates. Our students are unique. Our students are different. They have different needs. And when a policy, when a state policy takes those decisions away from teachers and parents, we're hurting students. Thank you. Uh, Grant Ritchie. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, so if we take away this policy, I'm just wondering then how would we measure reading results statewide would, would there be a way to measure it statewide or would it just be through uh, the local school districts testing policies and that would be sent to the state or... well i'll just point out that while uh, house bill 497 eliminates the extra administration of the statewide reading test uh, in third grade that happens in the fall um, it does not eliminate the third grade reading test so there is still going to be uh, that uh, standardized test uh, that does allow uh, a school district to see how their students are doing overall uh, against that state standard and and you know and that those test results will still be available to uh, teachers and to families um, so it does not eliminate the third grade test. Representative Manning was there anything <laughs> did I get that right? No, yes, you, you're exactly right. Uh, we, we still continue with that. Now, you know, we may have to change uh, the report card a, a bit, and that's something we'll have to look at um, if this bill passes. But um, we continue with the, the spring third grade uh, state tests, so we would have those results. So I want to just point out that in the chat, uh, we have provided uh, links to some, I think, uh, valuable resources uh, that provides further context uh, and further detail on what we talked about today. So uh, before you log off, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to capture those links uh, so that you can do uh, some additional learning yourselves uh, as you're working on, on your stories. Um, let me see if there's any final questions before we wrap up. I don't see anybody else raising a hand. Uh, so I just wanna say thank you again uh, to Dr. Thomas, Dr. Collins, Representative Manning uh, and Mrs. Carney for being with us today. Uh, for all of you for paying attention to this important issue. Um, we are very hopeful and, and appreciate your leadership in terms of 
of having the State Board of Education uh, speak officially in support of this change in policy. Uh, and then again, we're gonna continue our advocacy with the Ohio Senate uh, as we move forward. Um, so again, uh, on behalf of the Ohio Education Association, our members and staff really appreciate your time today. Hope you have a great day.